was lame. I heard the people on Facebook louder. Good morning, church. I am in tears again because I am seeing all of your faces. For those that are comfortable, no mask, please feel free to wear a mask if you, if you need to, if you want to. Um, but it is good to be here and it is good to see all of you. We welcome our Facebook friends and family. And we're so glad that we have the technology that we can join together in that way. You know, there is just something special when you have chosen, like you have chosen to come here today and worship. Oh my gosh, there's Maddie. Hey Maddie, I just saw you. You have chosen to come here and worship. And when you, because you have chosen to come here and, and worship, um, there's something special I think that really happens. And it's hard to name it, but we know that we feel it. Um, we are connected to God in a special way. We're connected to each other in a special way. There's something that happens when we choose to come to worship. We get fuel for the week ahead. You know, there's something in us that's like gives us energy to face the week ahead. And it makes worship so much more powerful and meaningful. Um, and so I just invite you as we come together in this time of worship to take, pray with me, with your heart and your mind and in your spirit and soul, um, the words that I'm about to pray. So let's go to God in prayer. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Oh God who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations. And by that same light, guide us to hear your words and receive your grace. And now, Father, let us come together and pray that same prayer together as a community that you've taught your first disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Um, as the band gets ready to lead us in our opening song this morning, what a beautiful name, right? Um, stand, sing from your heart like the name of Jesus and what Jesus means in your life and in your soul and in your spirit. Let's stand and sing.
powerful name. If you would like to get your hymnal, you can get your hymnal and turn to number 890. The words are also going to be on the screen. Um, this is today is part of our worship. We are going to say a prayer of confession. Um, confessing with our hearts that we are sinful at times, right? That we need forgiveness. We seek forgiveness. So let's join together. Most merciful God. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. You all are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please have a seat. Oh, I lied. I forgot we're doing fist bumps and waves. So now that means you got to get back up so you can say you had your exercise for the day. So, you know, elbows, fist bumps, waves, let's say, take just a moment to say good morning to one another. You all will find the words to the anthem in your bulletin um, to kind of help you to uh, hear the words we are singing. Um, but this song, it, it's a beautiful song, and I don't know if you've ever walked a path where you have felt alone and you feel like God is not with you. But after you have walked that path, you look back and reflect and you see God was all around you. Um, so this song is called Christ Be With Me, and I know you all feel that, and I hope you feel that when we sing it.
That was so beautiful. I'm crying. Well, I am crying. <laughs> Jim said me too. until you quit playing. And it's the music that's getting me. Oh, you're going to keep playing. Uh, I said, it's the music that's getting to me. Ah, whew. What a glorious church that we have to come. And look at, at all of our college kids and our babies and our graduates and friends. And it's just like that song just kind of got me, right? Like Christ with us and around us and before us. And that's okay. And that is who we are and what we're about. And it fills my soul so full to tears. It's the overflowing tears. And so as you give your tithes and offerings, right, like that's what this time is, there's baskets. You can put your money in the baskets. You can send a check. You can, do, you can give however you want to. But in moments like this, this is why we give. And when I pull out of my driveway and I see a yard sign from this church to my kid, this is you did it, senior. It does something. I've had a couple people say something to me. It's a witness. Not just to me, but to the community and to the world that Christ is with us and around us and behind us and beside us. What a glorious day to be a Christian in a world where Christianity seems to be waning. So as you give, celebrate what you are giving to, something bigger than ourselves, something that keeps Christ moving forward, right? That's what's so beautiful about it. So um, just remember next Sunday, we are going to celebrate our graduates. We're going to have a, a, a brunch down at the pavilion at 9. Everyone is welcome to come and be a part of that. We'll recognize the seniors during worship too. Michelle says to all of the seniors and all of the seniors who aren't here but you know who they are, she needs your picture. Um, so she wants a picture of you, so be sure and do that. And then I also want to announce to you, if you have friends, neighbors, grandkids, whatever, we are going to do in-person vacation Bible school. People are registering now. It's going to be in July this year. We, July the 11th through the 13th. Um, it's just we're going to do shorten, shorten the days, but we're still going to need all the help, right, and, we're, um, and all the kids. So I just wanted to remind you of that. You can go ahead and begin registering for that. Um, the other announcements were, were on the, the, the monitors up there, and they'll be on the monitors at the end if you miss something um, that you want to see. So um, with that, I think it is time for Jenny to come and do children's moments. So all the kids, come on. All right, come on up. See some faces I haven't seen in a while. I'm excited. Come on up. Just like we used to do. Come on up, ladies. Really, Mark? <laughs> playing that background music. I'm getting married next week. <laughs> He's getting me ready for it. Hello, Miss Harper. So I have a question this morning. Do you have, ooh, do you have friends? <gasps> I have Beckett. You have Beckett. Who's one of your friends? Mm, I don't know. Well, I bet you have built-in friends right here with your sisters. I know that's always a built-in friend. Finley, who's one of your friends? Gracie. Gracie. What about you, Iris? Who's one of your friends? Safira. Sister Safira. That's right. Now, how do you make friends? How do you make friends? What do you think? You be nice. 
A good one. You be nice to people, yeah. What else? How do you make friends, Harper? Um, have fun together. Have fun together. That's cool. Have you ever met someone that maybe wasn't very nice? Yeah. Have you ever met someone that wasn't very nice? If I get like. <laughs> Have you ever met someone that wasn't a little nice? Maybe at school or somewhere. Tequila. <laughs> you know what? That's a perfect thing. Guess what? Friends can be sometimes. It's sometimes it's hard if they can be your friends and fun. Sometimes, sometimes they're not nice, right? But I want to tell you about. Did you know Jesus was friends with everyone? Did you know that? That's everyone. Speak different languages. Even people that speak different languages. Even people who, we read about someone, sometimes people that are sick. He was friends with people that might have been sick, that people didn't want to go around. Yeah? Um, I love you. I love you too. Always and forever. So, that's right. I mean, sometimes... Jesus was friends with everyone, whether they spoke different languages, whether they were sick. He loved everyone. Does that sound easy or does that sound hard? Hard. Hard sometimes, right? Because you look around and sometimes people are having a hard time and you don't really feel like, oh, if, if sister's being a little hard to love, oh, that's hard. But Jesus says we're supposed to love everyone, right? What about the king? What about the king? Oh. Yeah, like King Herod, he was after Jesus. I know, but Jesus, he was called to love everyone, and he did. And he went and ate with them, and he went and had, he had parties with them. <laughs> so Jesus, we're supposed to follow in Jesus' footsteps, right? So we're supposed to love everyone, and we're trying to be friends with everyone. And I know that's hard, right? Yeah, but you think you can try? Think we could try just like Jesus? We can try. That's all we can say, right? Well, let's let's pray to God and maybe ask him to help us. Okay? So dear God, he got help us to be friends with everyone. Help us to love everyone. Just like Jesus. Amen. All right. <laughs> Jenny's getting married to Jordan. We're gonna sing a song. <laughs> nah. Um, but I do want you all to kneel, okay. if you don't mind. Um, I'm gonna lay hands on them, kids. We're gonna pray. Jenny and Jordan are getting married next week. If anybody feels comfortable, you don't, don't come if you don't feel comfortable, but if you do feel comfortable, you want to come lay hands on them um, as we send them off next week um, into a beautiful week where it will end up that they will begin a beautiful marriage. Um, I hope that's okay, Jenny. <laughs> now you can cry. Gracious and holy God, this church supports this couple in ways that they cannot even begin to imagine. I pray that you bless um, their week ahead, you bless their honeymoon, but most importantly that you bless their marriage, that they will remember moments like this when their church family surrounded them, laid hands on them, prayed for them. And sent them forth to say, go and shine for Christ in your marriage. Lord, I pray that they would have much, much happiness. That even when they fuss and fight and look at each other and have disagreements, that, that right in the middle they'll just bust out laughing. And that they'll come together and they will mend fences and they will um, draw closer to one another. I pray, Lord, that as Jenny walks down the aisle, Jordan will look at her and he will know in the depths of his soul that this is the partner you created for him. That as Jenny sees him for the first time that she will well up and she will go, thank you God for giving me my mate. Lord, we can't all be there with them. 
physically, but we are with them in spirit as they go forth into um, the beginning of a beautiful life together. It is in your name that we pray this prayer. Amen. Yay! We're happy for you. Y'all can stand. This is him number 340. Come, you sinners, for it. So as we begin this morning with our scripture, um, with Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, I want to catch you up. This is in the, the first part of chapter 2 of Mark. Jesus has healed a leper and he has just healed a paralyzed man where four of this paralyzed man's friends, four of his friends, pushed through their crowds and finally took the man up on the roof, dug a hole through the roof, and lowered their friend to Jesus. They were determined, weren't they? Four friends took it upon themselves to take this man and lower him to Jesus. Jesus saw their determination and, uh, and said, you know, 
your faith has, has healed you, your faith has made you well to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. And everybody was all stirred up. Y'all know what that's like when everybody gets stirred up, right? Everybody was all stirred up. The teachers, the Pharisees of the, of, of the law, the religious leaders, they were mad. The crowds were astonished. And right here in the very beginning of Mark's gospel, Jesus claims who he is. And the fallout from those claims... Hmm. Well, we know the price that he paid for the fallout from those claims and those miracles and all that was being revealed. So we get up to verse 13 in this chapter and it says once again, so Jesus has healed the leper, he has healed the paralytic, the fallout is beginning. And it says, the scripture says, and once again Jesus went out beside the lake a large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Levi, a.k.a. Matthew, a.k.a. disciple. He saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So one could interpret the healings, the miracles, um, the teachings that, um, you know, they were kind of in the face. Of, of the law of the Pharisees and the other religious leaders. And, and wherever Jesus was and whenever he sh showed up, you could kind of interpret that he was always seen to be in the Pharisees' face, right? At least you could see how they would interpret that. But really, Jesus, I mean, he was just doing what he was sent to do. He was healing. He was miracles. He was bringing a different message, a message of hope and a message of love. But the religious leaders had to be thinking, what's he thinking, right? If you interpreted it the way that I just claimed that you could say, well, I can see why they'd be mad. We would kind of look at one another and we go, what are they thinking? I could stand here and I could proclaim a lot of things if I weren't afraid to claim a lot of things sometimes, right? You could too. What were you thinking? What was Jesus thinking? He had to have known that he was going to upset the religious apple cart. He had to have known it wasn't going to be good for him, yet there he went. He did it anyway. And one of the most obvious apple cart flipping things that Jesus did time and time again was sit at the table and eat with those sinners. And eat with those tax collectors. And eat with those lepers. Now we all know that the tax collectors were in the business of taking money from the Jewish people and giving it to the Romans, to the, the overlords in the Roman political world. They were the lowest of the lows. There was no respect. There was no dignity for them. Not, no one accepted them. No one was going to invite the tax collectors over for dinner. Right? They were not going to be invited to the table, especially if you wanted to be part of the respectable society. If you wanted to be respected and looked, looked upon as valuable or with honor, that would never happen. They would never associate with such scoundrels. 
And that's the very people that Jesus ate with. It's the very people he sat at the table with. So in other words, what Jesus was doing is he was disobeying the Jewish food laws because they could only eat clean food, right? And if you ate, if you sat down at a table and you had clean food, but the sinners and those people ate with it, it made the food unclean. Or so they believed. You can't do that. That wasn't the right thing. That isn't how it is in God's world. That's not what we teach. And on top of all of that, dining at a table, we talked about this last week. There's something special that goes on, right? It's an intimate thing. It's a bonding thing. It's a social thing. Friendships are formed. Partnerships are formed. I can't imagine how many, how many times two families came and sat together at the table to marry off one daughter to one son. Something happened at the table. And by golly, if you were going to be at a table, you'd better have it right. Have it together. Live and follow those laws. So for Jesus to dine with these tax collectors and sinners was about four steps beyond improper. Couldn't believe it. Now who are these sinners? We know who the tax collectors are, right? They cheated, they stole, they took money, put it in their pockets. We know that. But who are these sinners? Who are these sinners that, that, that we're talking about in this scripture? And really it's anyone who didn't follow the law. It's people who didn't follow the law. They were the sinners. And, and, and so if they had a physical ailment, if they had whatever ailment they had, um, they had to be sinners because they wouldn't have been in that condition if they had followed the law. Because following the law meant that you would be beyond all that. You wouldn't get sick. You wouldn't get leprosy. Because you are religious. And you know what you're supposed to do in order to stay holy. And you do these things and you are good to go. I often wonder what happened to a Pharisee or a scribe or a Sadducee or a teacher of the law if they fell and broke their leg. I mean, their life would be done. What if they got sick? I mean, think about the Pharisee that's standing there going, Oh, Lord, I'm so righteous. And he tripped and fell and broke his arm. I mean, that would just end it all. Who would eat with him? Oh, that just led to these good religious folks thinking that they were all that in a bag of Wheaties, right? Box of Wheaties. I get my metaphors wrong. Here's my kid. I know he's laughing at me. They were better than because they were holy. And because they were righteous and holy and better than, it put a veil over their eyes. They could not see past it who's that sound like I mean if we're honest who does this sound like in a lot of ways it sounds like what I grew up listening to and believing and thinking it sounds a lot like you and me and us and we depending on the situation depending on who the sinner is depending on who the tax collector is. We view other in that way if they don't fit in our circle. And we may not say that we follow the law or the letter of the law, but really we kind of do. We have our own little laws. We have our set of boundaries, our set of, of right and wrongs. And if, if anyone steps outside of that set of right and wrongs that we have created for our own self to say that I am a Christian and that I am holy and that I am good, anyone outside of that boundary, we do this. Mm. We do. And we start judging and we start pointing and we start cutting their feet out from underneath of them. 
It's just who we are. And I think it is so interesting. It's just so interesting to me that the Bible, that scriptures are full of stories of how Jesus went against that. He was for them too. He tried to reach the religious folks. But he went against that and said, no, don't do it that way. Do it this way. And all these 2,000 years later, guess what we're doing? We're still doing it that way and not this way. Isn't that crazy? I think it's just crazy. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to make a blasphemous statement. What I just said, that's why I hate religion. I hate religion. I hate it. Now, oh, I don't have any more water. Somebody's going to have to get me water. Where's Pam? You got water? Okay, I'm going to need water. I know I'm going to need water. Because I'm going to give y'all an illustration of what religion is like for people who need Jesus. I'm going to show you what religion is like when we, people who love Jesus and try so hard, but when we get it wrong. I'm going to tell you what religion is like when we try and cram the Bible down someone else's throat. I'm going to tell you what religion is like when you so desperately want your kids and your grandkids to return to church and you hound them and hound them and hound them and tell them how life is going to be so much better if you're in church. And if you're not in church, you're going to hell and all the other stuff that you do. Are you ready? This is what it's like. Woo! I don't like sour things. That's what it's like. Are you hearing me? It's the most sour thing to a spirit that you will ever have. Give me a minute. That's religion. We don't want it to be religion. But it's what it is. We push that faith and our beliefs and our rules and our doctrine and, and our look and how we dress and how we sit. And we do this and we say, you're good enough and you're not good enough. And you can come, but you know, we're on. But if you hold yourself to do the right thing, it'll be good. I know I just said that, but I want to say it again. I had a meeting yesterday with the Sanctuary Counseling Group, and, and um, as we sat and we were talking about the mission of Sanctuary Counseling Group, you could start seeing people's hackles go up when they were talking about what it is, that, who, who they are as a Christian organization. And, and I looked at the faces of some of the people who, by the way, are all Christian in that room except for maybe one, and, and he's Hindu, he's Hindi. And, um, and I, lo I looked at their faces, and they were just like, it was like we were chewing on a lemon, a sour lemon. They couldn't take it. And afterwards, I talked to, to a young lady, and she's like, you know, I love Jesus, but I do not like the church. And basically what she said was, the church keeps giving me sour lemons. The church to me, the church that she had gone to, I told her to come here, by the way. I said, you come here. I said, come move and be my neighbor. Let's change the world together, right? They're not teaching. They're teaching the Pharisee stuff. They're teaching the Sadducee stuff. They're teaching the laws. They're not teaching what is really important. And I want you to tell me what's really important. It's not religion, but it's what? A relationship. Who's the relationship with? Jesus, do you see the difference? 
See, Jesus doesn't make us too judgmental or too rigid or too mean-spirited or too sour. Jesus brings sweetness to the table. That's what Jesus does. I'm looking for my recipe. Ah. Jesus is lemon velvet cake with lemon cream cheese frosting. Jesus is not sour lemons. When you go to the table with Jesus, when you have a relationship with Jesus, Jesus brings the sweetness because Jesus brings acceptance and Jesus brings love and Jesus brings a different type of teaching and Jesus says let me walk with you and Jesus says it doesn't matter who you are or what you're choosing or what color your skin is or what kind of clothes you wear Jesus says it doesn't matter you're the one that I'm saying will you come follow me there's a hope in a relationship with Jesus that surpasses anything that religion can teach you Somebody ought to say amen to that. Because that's, that's just gospel truth right there. That's what relationships does. It's what it should do. It should, it should bring a sweetness and a joy and an acceptance. Isn't that what Jesus did in every scripture that you read? Except for maybe the time that he turned the tables over because the Pharisees were cheating people? Here's the thing. Jesus sat at the table with the religious folks too. He ate lunch with them too. He broke bread with them too. Even though they rejected that Jesus was God and that Jesus was bringing a new way, he still sat and he dined with them trying to convince them there is a better way. So folks, we're supposed to be like Jesus, right? We claim it. We're the hands, we're the feet, we're the vessel in which God is using us, the people of faith, to share with the community and the world around us the goodness and sweetness of what Jesus and a relationship with Jesus can be like. We are to sit at the table with those sinners and those tax collectors, in other words. But here's the kicker. (laughs) We are the sinners and the tax collectors, aren't we? Everyone is in the same boat. Some people are on a journey a little bit further. Some people have accepted Christ. Maybe some have not accepted Christ each other. We need to sit at the table with them. Invite them, include them. We need to sit at the table, or we should be sitting at the table with all of those who are fearful to sit at the table with us. And show them a different way. Have you ever walked into a room or walked into a dinner party or walked somewhere, been somewhere where you know that you were uncomfortable and you knew that the hatchet was about to drop? You ever been there? You know that feeling? And then do you know the feeling of what it's like when it turns out really well for you and you're like, oh! I thought they were going to be blah, 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 blah. And they really weren't. They were so loving and accepting. Do y'all know what that feeling is like? That's what we're supposed to do. That's, That's part of our community. That's part of why we come and get fueled up. That's part of why we... Why, why, why we want to learn about Jesus and we sing songs and we have tears and we teach our kids the stories of Jesus so that we can have this strength to be that person for someone else. We're supposed to sit at the table with the leper and the paralytic and sit at the table with the prodigal son. 
And we're supposed to know that whoever is at the table sitting with us, they're supposed to be there too. Even though they may not look like you or live like you or choose like you. Oh, man. Who are we sitting with? Who are we inviting to the table? Jesus is lemon velvet cake with lemon cream cheese frosting. Who did not see this recipe and go, yum? If you don't remember anything else, remember yum. When I was a bit rebellious and an anti-churcher and an anti-God person, you've heard me say that before. There's this guy that I worked with. His name was Luke. Luke, I hope you're listening today. And all the other Christians that I worked with, they would say things like this. And I'm just being honest. She says she's changed her life, but look at her over there drinking that beer at dinner. And I can remember Luke saying, I can't... He wasn't saying it to me, but I could overhear him saying, don't you worry about whether she's drinking beer at dinner. God's got her. I can remember people saying, especially this one individual, did you hear that curse word come out of her mouth? Did you see that guy she's dating? Did you see who she went to lunch with? And it was judge judge, beat down, beat down, beat down. And I would hear Luke say, don't listen to her. God loves you. And you're with God now. And you just keep learning and walking with Jesus. See, Luke gave me lemon velvet cake with lemon cream cheese icing. Here's a final thought for you. I have never made this recipe. But it looks like it'd be so good. Oh my gosh, I can just taste it. But I've never made it yet. I'm going to make it, but I hadn't made it yet. And I think about you and I think about me when it comes to sitting at the table with sinners and tax collectors and those people. And when it comes to sharing our faith and, and inviting someone into a relationship with Jesus Christ. It sounds really good, doesn't it? But have you ever done it? It is time that we live like Jesus. That is when the kingdom of life will come alive. God, may you forgive a sinner like me. Amen. I love you, Corey. All right, so we're going to end the service today with a song called Jesus, Friend of Sinners. I think it ties in the sermon pretty well. So stand and sing with us.
looking around but never looking up. I'm so double-minded. A blank-eyed saint with dirty hands and a heart divided. sinners just like me, a leper at your feet. If we take that spirit into the work week, into the world this week, think how many people you can bring hope to. Go in peace, be Christ. Amen and amen. All right, Harper, take Jesus out. Mm -hmm.